A cure for opium addiction was the original great white hope, and a 20-year-old German chemist had boiled opium down into morphine in 1805 to invent a cure for opium addiction, and he experimented with it for the next decade using himself as a guinea pig. A Frenchman discovered codeine out of opium, and another Frenchman found Thebane, and it would be another 20 years before anyone would discover caffeine or nicotine. Dr. Lafarge started using the needle in 1830, but it had already been invented by Hero of Alexandria, and the British Christopher Wren injected opium into dogs in 1656 using goose quills, while the Germans were doing the same to humans, but the results were so deleterious that the practice was suspended for the next two centuries. When Dr. Alexander Wood invented a hollow needle in 1853, he'd gotten the idea from the sting of a bee, and the theory was that injecting opium would prevent addiction since eating it was what had caused a hunger for the drug. Many doctors injected themselves daily and continued to practice medicine to an old age, and most did not suffer side effects from injection, but with the emergence of non-doctors using hypodermics in 1893, medical problems arose since sanitation was poor and improperly used needles caused hepatitis, blood poisoning, and abscesses. Since opium had a depressing effect on the heart and respiration, cocaine was added as a complement along with the opiate. Curiously, heroin itself appears to have little adverse physical effect upon the body, much of the addict's considerable health problems deriving from his or her lifestyle and the fact that today many simultaneously use cocaine to counteract heroin's numbing effect. Opium, A History, page 91. <coughs> In the 1830s, a Swiss scientist wrote Travels in Peru that described the locals chewing coca leaves and carrying his baggage for days without much food or sleep. And within 20 years, Merck was selling cocaine and they called it a restorative. And cocaine was to be used if you were tired or hungry or nervous or troubled, which meant just about everyone. Freud thought that cocaine might be able to cure opium addiction, and Freud was also trying to cure alcoholism with cocaine, and Freud gave cocaine to Bavarian soldiers from 1883 to 1887, and at the Ophthalmological Society meeting in 1884 in Heidelberg, it became official that cocaine worked as an anesthetic for the eyes. <coughs> A life insurance salesman from Georgia named Charles B. Towns came to New York in 1901, <coughs> and he was called the Emperor of the Cure Masters and Fraudsters by Mr. Booth. After failing in a stock brokerage firm, he saw an opportunity in addiction treatments and invented his cure. <coughs> details of which he kept secret. He somehow managed to dupe Theodore Roosevelt's physician into recommending him to the Assistant Secretary of State, Robert Bacon, who arranged for Towns to visit China, promoting his concoction with the War Department, which was seeking a cure for soldiers' disease, and with the American delegation to the Shanghai Opium Commission in 1909, when Towns claimed he had cured 4,000 opium addicts in the city. Towns became internationally renowned and was feted by politicians who were under pressure to do something about addiction and who lauded him for his altruism, for it was altruism, for it was reported Towns took little financial re reward for his work. Opium a History, page 94. Dr. Towns' formula was prickly ash bark, hyoscyamus, and belladonna, and was given by enema along with castor oil and strychnine, and people called his cure the three D's for diarrhea, delirium, and damnation. By the time people found his cure was fake, Dr. Towns was a rich man, although Towns truly believed his cure worked, because nobody ever came back for seconds. 
Towns had gotten his idea from Dr. Osgood, who'd gone to China in 1878 with an addiction treatment he had invented. And Osgood used chloral hydrate and potassium bromide for the first three days, along with pills made of belladonna, gentian, valerian, quinine, and ginger. Mike Gray, in his book Drug Crazy, said that everyone knew Towns' cure was worthless by 1920, but the effectiveness of it had become law after it was passed through Congress, and it was therefore now quote-unquote legally true. And when they tried to follow up on the patients, most were addicted again. But the Treasury Department had gotten all geared up and were ready to roll because they were operating under the understanding that there actually was a cure. <clears throat> when buyer and seller kept it private and neither party complained, the government had a difficult time trying to interfere. But when cash changed hands too often, it cost money to replace the worn-out currency after it went through the laundry too many times, so dealers were supposed to be paying a few percent in taxes for the privilege of using cash money. Paying a nominal nominal amount of taxes would cover the cost of what it took to make money available, so the Harrison Narcotics Act was created as a tax law, and while the U.S. Treasury were more careful about dispensing, oh, while the U.S. Treasury could put a tax on a drug used by a doctor's supervision, under a doctor's supervision, it was also thought that doctors were, were more careful about dispensing opium. When the Harrison Narcotics Act, written by Dr. Wright, became law in the winter of 1914, medical use of opium was allowed, but smuggling was still all the rage because it was, after all, just a tax law. With the Harrison Act of 1914, it took only three years to shut down all the addiction clinics, and no alternative was made available. So all the addicts became criminals. The jails and the mental hospitals were already full, so addicts were turned away to fend for themselves, and it was easier for the government to go after doctors than drug dealers because the doctors had addresses and telephone numbers. After the Harrison Act, doctors could only prescribe opium for addicts who were hospitalized and undergoing withdrawal, while the housewives withdrew themselves. Before long, the Treasury increased the prosecution of doctors because too many doctors treating their addicted patients were inadvertently supplying the black market. And in the ten years after the Harrison Act, one-third of all prison inmates were there because of the Har Harrison Act, while the government was operating under the legally proven hypothesis that there was a cure available of which the prisoners had chosen not to partake. The Treaty of Versailles in 1918 addressed the opium trade again, as did the Charter of the League of Nations, and when the Geneva International Opium Conference convened in 1924, Soviet Russia did not attend, claiming they had no problem with opium addiction. <coughs> the Geneva Convention tried to regulate opium again the following year, in 1925, while Russia knew it was just a trade deal and not a serious attempt to address the problem. One of the Ziegfeld Follies girls was found dead of a heroin overdose in 1920, and an army captain had been supplying her with the heroin, and both Hollywood and Broadway had a reputation for cultivating drug use because many film stars and stage performers were addicted. In show business, there were many who had become hopeless alcoholics while others just ate pills, and in 1927, the Bureau of Prohibition took over enforcement of the Harrison Act, while before then it had been handled by the IRS. And as it happens with government jobs that are linked to numbers and statistics, the truth about addicts became the first casualty. The Federal Bureau of Narcotics... <clears throat> The Federal Bureau of Narcotics was created with the 1930 Porter Act that separated the Bureau of Prohibition from narcotics. And when Hoover signed H.R. 11143, the bill also created a division of mental hygiene in 1930, 
and Congress had shut down the Narcotics Division of the Treasury in 1929 because they'd become a bunch of crooks. The new FBN was under the jurisdiction of the Treasury Department, and Harry Anslinger would run it until JFK fired him, and his predecessor in the Narcotics Division had been Colonel Levi G. Nutt, who'd been fired for taking money from the Mafia. When Colonel Nutt had shut down the addition, addiction clinics with the Harrison Act, the criminal underworld had happily taken over the opium trade, and revenue agents had been running amuck, and a third of them would be fired for criminal behavior. Anslinger hated that poor people were often taken advantage of and frequently killed by accidental overdoses, while, quote, the unknown usually of the upper classes have the means, money, and professional contacts, which very often permit addiction without danger, close quote, the protectors, the heroic story of the narcotics agents, citizens, and officials in their unending, unsung battles against organized crime in America by Harry J. Anslinger, New York, Farrar, Strauss, and Company, Incorporated, 1964, page 22. Anslinger spoke German because his parents were from Germany and from Switzerland, and Anslinger had worked as a spy in Germany in 1917 before America got into the Great War. And after the war, Anslinger saw prostitution and opium working together, and he believed that women were intentionally turned into addicts in order to exploit them as prostitutes. Anslinger went all over the world paying prostitutes to tell him their stories, and he would pay them but would leave them unmolested. And Anslinger thought that if he rid America of opium, he could cure the terrible problem of prostitution. Anslinger worked for the U.S. State Department in Holland for three years after the Great War, and he learned to speak Dutch, and he got to meet the Kaiser in exile. Anslinger was sent to Germany in 1921 to work for the American commissioner in Hamburg for two years, and then he was sent to Venezuela in 1923, and then to the Bahamas in 1926 as chief of the Division of Foreign Control for the Treasury. Anslinger became the U.S. consul in the Bahamas, and on Halloween in 1929, Anslinger became the assistant commissioner of Prohibition, whose jurisdiction was Cuba and Canada. <clears throat> Anslinger thought that Canada was cold, and his French was not good, but he liked Cuba, and he was certain that rum runners breaking the law just to make money was shameful. The Revenue Cutter Service had merged with the Life Saving Service in 1915 and had become the Coast Guard and Anslinger wanted to use them along with the Navy to enforce prohibition. Anslinger pushed for a $1,000 fine and six months in jail for buying alcohol, with the second offense costing $5,000 and two years in jail. In 1931, the League of Nations Limitation Convention restricted poppy sales to only medical and scientific needs and only a dozen companies were allowed to make narcotic drugs, and for the next decade, thousands of doctors were arrested and hundreds of medical clinics were closed. The FBN built special prisons for addicts who are now sentenced as being criminally insane. And as Hitler's war approached in 1936, the FBN gathered opium to lock up in the U.S. Treasury, and they shopped for it in Yugoslavia, Turkey, Bulgaria, and Afghanistan. <clears throat> and by 1940, Anslinger had 300 tons of it in the Treasury vaults, enough to last America for four years. After Hitler's war, the opium trade could have been completely controlled, but the CIA was more interested in stopping communism than in policing the opium trade. And the CIA used the poppy market as a tool towards their goal of shutting down the Jew communists. And Anslinger was fully on board because he believed that communism and addiction worked together. With the National Security Act of 1947, the Narcotics Bureau was given their own school, and they were given more guns and greater power to arrest people. And they were given permission to wiretap telephones, 
and the part in the legislation about hospital care for addicts and treatment centers was not taken very seriously because nobody wanted to put criminals into hospitals alongside law-abiding citizens. Anslinger was allowed to work outside the U.S. because he told everyone that American soldiers were coming back from Europe under the influence of drugs and his FBN would cooperate with the CIA to procure drugs for their MK Ultra efforts to make suspected spies talk. The FBI experimented on some Navy officers by telling them what day their ship was sailing, then tried to get the information out of them after slipping them drugs without their knowledge. And these experiments had been going on since 1943 and would continue for decades thereafter under MK Ultra. Anslinger would open a pack of cigarettes and put truth drugs in them and then reseal the pack. And they also tried peyote and sodium amytal and marijuana, but their favorite truth drug was tetrahydrocannabinol acetate, although no sailors would reveal the date except one who had also been hypnotized. Anslinger had an agent named Garland who'd been a revenue agent in New York City during Prohibition, and Garland had been in charge of 1,200 agents let loose on the city. And in 1940, Agent Garland was sent to Washington, D.C. to create a secret army for General Sherman Miles, and one of his training camps was named Shangri-La by FDR, but Eisenhower changed the name to Camp David. Agent Garland was discharged after Hitler's war as a light colonel, and Anslinger sent him to Europe to chase mafiosis. And when the Korean War came along in 1950, Agent Garland was tasked to train spies for the army in Korea. <clears throat> after the armistice, Agent Garland went to work for the IRS, but after a year as head of the tax frauds division, he was forced to resign over mistakes on his own tax returns, and then Agent Garland went to Africa to teach the tribes how to establish their own secret police. Another agent working for Anslinger was Charlie Cigars, who was directed to bust Lucky Luciano, and while there were many plenty of Jewish mobsters selling opium, Anslinger concentrated on the Italians, and Lucky Luciano called him Asslinger. Charles Cigars was used to make 1,000 arrests, and Charles Cigars, Charlie Cigars, especially liked Italy, and once chased a baroness through the entire length of the country until he stopped her at the Bremer, Brenner Pass, and she was accused of being a Nazi spy, smuggling a half million dollars worth of jewelry. Charles, Charlie Cigar's job had been to travel overseas asking for drugs while flashing large amounts of cash, and Anslinger would send Charlie Cigars over to talk to Fidel about stopping the poppy trade. Anslinger's favorite agent was named White, a big guy who'd once strangled a Japanese to death with his bare hands and then kept a picture of him on the wall. And Agent White had started as a newspaper man and gotten rid of many hip-sing criminals in Seattle by sending them back to China. With agents like these, Anslinger had become more powerful than the FBI, and he personally knew Cubans, and he knew all the top CIA people, as well as Texans, and Anslinger was horrified that JFK was having parties with naked girls swimming in the White House pool in the presence of drugs. Jack Anderson said that Anslinger was contemptuous of the FBI, whose idea of infiltrating the Mafia was to take off their ties. And both F JFK and Bobby Kennedy thought Anslinger was a menace to freedom. And Anslinger thought JFK was the Antichrist for selling America out to the Communists. If tomorrow the leaders of the free nations were to exceed every demand made by the communist leaders, if they were to neutralize every strategic air command base, if they were to grant the demands on Germany, if they were to neutralize Formosa, if they were to recognize Red China and admit it to the United Nations, 
if the United States were to withdraw every serviceman and weapon within the borders of the continental United States, the communists would merely believe they had won massive victories in the class war. A step towards our final conquest and destruction would have been taken. We must either recognize this and defend against it, or ignore it and be destroyed. We have no other choice. You can trust the communists to be communists by Dr. Fred Schwartz, New York Prentiss Hall, Inc., 1960-1972, page 6. In pursuit of the Vietnam War, a handful of U.S. companies were awarded over $12 billion in contracts for material and services. And while much of America had prospered by it, so many good and decent American soldiers were lost that one cannot read this without heartbreak. There had been 20,000 pounds of bombs that failed to detonate on impact in Vietnam, and these had been used as the raw material by the Viet Cong for booby traps. And by 1973, the DEA was splitting the profits of the opium trade with the country of origin. The Asians simply did not believe that the United States was investing the sums we were putting into Vietnam, or the manpower we were stationing there, or the enormous bases we were building in South Vietnam and Thailand, simply to fight Ho Chi Minh. No, China was the objective. That was the way they calculated it. We were preparing to fight China. Behind the Lines, page 240. Brezhnev calls President Nixon on the hotline and says, I've heard you have a new supercomputer that can predict events in the year 2000. Yes, Mr. General Secretary, Nixon replies proudly, we have such a computer. Well, Mr. President, can you tell me what the names of the Politburo members will be then? A long silence. Aha, Brezhnev exclaims, your computer isn't so sophisticated after all. No, Mr. General Secretary, Nixon replies, it answered your question, but I can't read it. It's in Chinese. Breaking with Moscow by Arkady N. Shevchenko. New York Balanchine Books, Random House, Inc., 1985, page 220. As Mao was dealing with China's opium problem, and as the USAFA began training its first Air Force officers, Anslinger arrested some Italians and some French selling poppies in Vietnam in 1958, and the Vietnam War became possible when Anslinger's arrests left a large gaping vacancy in the opium trade in the Golden Triangle. In no other trade can so large a profit be turned so quickly, not even by rigging stocks, and that is why there are so many traffickers. Protectors, the heroic story, page 21. When Hitler's war ended, the French in Vietnam started up the opium trade freely again, freely again, and heroin addiction increased in America. And Senator McCarthy thought the influx of opium into America was a communist conspiracy, just as the prohibitionists in the previous generation had known that Bolshevism ran on booze. The, ocu the octopus that lived in Peking had long tentacles, and the red octopus, Nick admitted as he stubbed out his cigarette, was getting quite a bargain this time. It was to the red's advantage to promote the use of dope wherever they could. It weakened morale, sucked away the will to resist, gave the West another huge problem. So the reds took over a highly organized dope smuggling apparatus. Such an apparatus could be used for other things than smuggling, espionage. Thirdly, and possibly the most important to the Reds, were the fierce Kurds. They were always rebelling against Iran and Turkey, always agitating for self-government for a Kurdish republic. The Chinese would promise them that, would help them with money and guns to see that the Kurds kept on rebelling until they got a Red Kurdish Republic. <clears throat> Istanbul, a Nick Carter Killmaster spy chiller. New York and London Award Books, Universal Publishing and Distributing Corporation, 1965, page 98, dedicated to the men of the secret services of the United States of America. The Communist Party hadn't even been able to get a good parade going in America, <clears throat> so Senator McCarthy thought they had moved underground and were operating in secret. 
and many who knew nothing about communism had attended meetings of the Communist Party out of curiosity, or sometimes they'd gone to one of their whoopee parties. <clears throat> McCarthy was the senator from Wisconsin in 1952, and McCarthy hired Roy Cohn and Bobby Kennedy to prosecute communist collusionists and he used a Jewish lawyer because people were accusing him of going after Jews instead of people colluding with communists, which in many cases was the same thing. And the McCarthy hearings were very one-sided, but they sold a lot of newspapers and were broadcast on the radio and were highly entertaining. <clears throat> the hearings were held in the same room that had been used for the first time in 1912 to investigate the sinking of the Titanic and each of the committeemen had their own gavel and their own microphone, and when they didn't like what was being said, they would all bang away together, and they often did not like what was being said. Having cut his teeth on the McCarthy hearings, Bobby Kennedy would come back for round two of communist hunting with the senator from Arkansas, John L Little McClellan, and this time the McClellan committee would, hearings would morph into the Valachi hearings, but Bobby's participation would be cut short by his brother's assassination. For the McClellan committee hearings in the Senate, Bobby was put in charge of a frenzy of lawyers and 35 investigators and 45 accountants and 20 office personnel and Bobby and his agents would travel over two million miles around America, talking down to working people and accusing them of being mafia gangsters. Bobby had been a government lawyer since the day he graduated law school in 1951, and he had taken time off to run his brother's campaign for senator in 1952. And Bobby had already worked for four years for the senator from Arkansas before spending three years lawyering for his McClellan Commission from 1957 to 1959, where Bobby focused on Jimmy Hoffa and the Teamsters because during the McCarthy hearings in 1952, the link between the unions and their Jew communist organizers had been obvious to Bobby from day one. Bobby Kennedy called 1,500 witnesses to testify before the McClellan Committee, and most could not afford the trip to Washington without help from their unions, and those hearings would go on for years until they turned into the Valachi Inquisition in 1963. Bobby would gather telephone records from these workers who would call their bosses to ask how to answer the subpoenas that Bobby was handing out, requiring them to appear in front of the McClellan Commission, and Bobby used his wiretapped phone call record, records as proof of collusion and complicity with the mob. Many Italians were working for the unions because they'd been hired by people they knew when they came over to America, and they'd been working where their common language was spoken on the job site, and while the Irish and the Italians had Catholicism in common, they more often fought than not, competing for what work was available in America. Irish people like the Kennedys had a head start because they already spoke English when they hit the shore, and the Italians not only had to overcome a language barrier, but they had come from many different regions in Italy, so they weren't as homogeneous as the Irish. Both countries were relatively the same size, as Ireland along with Scotland was the size of Florida, while Italy was the size of Florida with Cuba added to it. The Camorra had started in Sicily when big landowners would hire thugs to protect them from outlaws and terrorists, and the thugs had soon been telling the landowners what to do, and Bobby Kennedy thought that labor unions worked the same way, that a factory owner would hire people to work, and before long the labor unions were dictating contract points to the factory owner. Mafia actions found their way into American unions because the people working in the U.S. government didn't know much about working-class people or what they needed to stay in business. So the working class relied more on their families than on technicalities in the rule of law, which remained a luxury for the lawyered class. 
Henry Ford had thought that union organizing was run by Jew communists because the strikes against his factories had stopped being about wages or safety and had turned into a circus show about how much poor people hated the rich. And these communistic protests would often escalate into real riots. Both the natural, National Guard and Federal troops had been asked to intervene in over 160 strikes, and the community organizer leaders tended to fight among themselves, and they would fight with the workers they were supposed to represent. So the labor organizers were unpredictable and unreasonable in making demands to managers and owners of businesses. Many Jews became involved in the trade union leadership because their Jewish doctrine had led them to believe that helping the oppressed would make them righteous before God. But their intervention often made the situation worse. And in the Colorado coal fields in 1913 and 1914, the National Guard and the Union fought it out until 70 men, 74 men, women, and children were dead. After Hitler's war, the real possibility that God had abandoned the Jews made the labor organizers redouble their efforts to stamp out what they perceived as oppression in an attempt to salvage the moral superiority they had before the death camps seriously shook their faith. Some substituted humanistic righteousness for what, re for what religious construct had been left behind the barbed wire when God abandoned them to the camps, and others had become disillusioned by the stifling demands of legalistic Judaism, and so they had migrated towards union politics. In the Colorado coal fields, workers were housed in fenced-off camps to which entry could be had only through heavily guarded gates. Undesirables naturally were, were kept out, and the term referred especially to union organizers and uncontrolled journalists. Dissenters or union members, when detected, were simply expelled, sometimes after being beaten. <clears throat> On October 17, 1913, an armored car driven by company deputies drove through a tent camp set up by strikers, parenthesis, they had had to leave their company houses closed parenthesis, shot it up and killed several men. On October 29, the governor of the state sent in the militia. J.D.R. Jr. was unceremoniously summoned before a congressional investigating committee. He naively told the committee he believed 90% of the men did not want a strike and favored the company. Blame for the whole affair was placed on quote-unquote union agitators. The Rockefeller Syndrome, page 178 and 9. One labor leader named Mr. Mooney was sentenced to death for bombing a preparedness parade on the 22nd of July in 1916 that killed six people. And Mr. Mooney had been kept in jail until someone brought in a photograph that showed him watching the parade from a nearby rooftop and he was allowed to leave the courthouse a free man. Another labor head was Samuel Gompers, who had started as a British cigar maker union apprentice. And the garment workers and the cigar makers union were strong because rich people were willing to pay good money for better clothes and decent cigars that were free of disease. The American Federation of Labor, AFL, wanted to protect and preserve specific skills in hopes of inspiring others to rise to their level while the Committee for Industrial Organizations, CIO, wanted to get unskilled people who worked in mass productions to sign up. The AFL had known from the beginning that the CIO, CIO and the Wobblies were mostly radical communists trying to overthrow the government, but as government found it easier to work with the unions rather than with companies who had problems with their workers, the unions gained strength and then got a big boost from the New Deal. FDR set up government agencies specifically to cooperate with the unions, and Ford went union in June of 1941, following a significant strike because he had a government contract to meet. Labor unions were responsible for setting standards, such as pipe sizes for liquids and how many steel beams could hold up a skyscraper or how wide roads should be. 
And the rules were not just about size and strength, but which, mis which materials to use. There was a shoemaker's union and a woodcutter's union and railroad workers' unions alongside the plumbers, carpenters, fitters, boilermakers, machinists, mechanics, masons, and miners. But most of all, unions were about putting safety first, and when Hoover Dam was being poured, workers might have gotten buried in the concrete but for the union's demand that it would weaken the structure, and management believed it. <clears throat> With the New Deal, instead of employers drowning in a landslide of lawsuits from their workers, the union lawyers could handle the workers' complaints and so the workplace became more productive. Congress had improved the inspection of meat, meat packing plants when countries overseas began refusing to buy American canned meat that had become dangerous to consume. And an IWW song said, there was a time when Uncle Sam, he had a war with Spain, and all the boys in Bonnie Blue were in the battle slain. Not all were killed by bullets, no, no, not by any means. The greatest part were killed by far by armors, pork, and beans. John Mason had invented a glass jar in 1858 for canning food at home, using rubber rings as seals, but they were not always reliable. And Alexander Kerr, K-E-R-R, -R, came up with a better two-piece cap in 1915. And home refrigeration had consisted of blocks of ice delivered to the door and packed away under straw in the root cellar or put in rudimentary kitchen ice boxes in the cities. The first horse-drawn ice cutter had been invented in 1825, so more people were able to buy ice to store food in their ice boxes. And after the war between the states, Germans were experimenting with mechanical refrigeration as a better way to store food. The Germans wanted a better way to make their good beer called lager, and they invented refrigerators that were mostly enormous units used in the shipping and meatpacking industry. And in 1911, the General Electric Company came up with a gas-powered home refrigerator, and that was followed by an electric model in 1927, and they added a separate freezer compartment in 1940. After Hitler's war, a massive wave of refrigerators moved into American homes, and there had been less than 20,000 televisions in America at the end of the war. But by 1950, a quarter million were being sold every month. With the television came advertisements for the new products now available in shopping centers in the growing suburbs, and there was plenty of great alcohol on sale to go along with it all. The money that had been created by going off the gold standard had emptied the surpluses from the warehouses into the stores. And FDR had hired the man who made Sears so successful as the director of his war production board, and by 1943, General Motors was building more things than Germany and Japan combined. America had spent $400 billion to stop Hitler, half of that in unpaid debt. And while it had been against the law to charge more than the government determined price during wartime, <clears throat> there had been over 30% inflation during Hitler's war, and the boost in prices helped bring on further prosperity. The economic boom was coupled with the fact that people wanted to bring new souls back into the world after so many had died in the war, and so the baby boom was on. With the new highways and housing developments, there was a great demand for household products and kitchen gadgets, and people wanted clothing made of the new fabrics, fabrics like polyester, not to mention the gift of saran wrap and Tupperware, and with new chemical fertilizers and pesticides, there was a desire for more interesting food now that it could be kept fresh in the refrigerator, and of course, America was blessed with the profusion of bigger and better automobiles for driving to and from the grocery store. The Teamsters Union was very good at going out on strike because they kept the country going. And without the Teamsters, all American business would stop cold. So the Teamsters were a union standing apart from all the others. 
the threat of communism after Hitler's war had been focused upon Russia rather than on Jew-communist union organizers, because it had become taboo to say anything unflattering about Jews after what had happened to them in the camps. The union principle remained that people should aspire to a higher standard, while the communists wanted to bring everyone down to the same level. And the struggle with labor potentiated after Hitler's war as returning soldiers flooded back into the workplace and the first to be sent back home to make room for the returning troops were the rosy riveters. Although with the booming economy, many rosies found employment in industrial jobs that paid much better than women's work. FDR had asked Hollywood to make pro-Russia movies during Hitler's war, to show Americans that we were allies, and the U.S. had recognized the Soviet government as soon as Hitler became Chancellor in 1933. And when the war was over, Senator McCarthy failed to understand that America had built up Russia in order to defeat Germany so that America could stay out of the war. Union labor during Hitler's war turned the American economy into a steamroller, producing Ford's Liberty ships and farming machinery, despite the rationing and price controls, and even the IWW had gone along with good business practices while the war was on. The AFL would last until 1955, when it would merge with the CIO and by 1960, Anslinger had arrested hundreds of Italians and French, selling opium in Europe, a difficult job when both buyer and seller stayed private and nobody ever called the police. <coughs> Dead bodies would regularly surface as the FBM used increasingly corrupt informants to investigate the trade, and through the Orient Express and the French Connection, the CIA used the Mafia in France to disrupt communist activities in French Indochina. The CIA recruited mountain people in the Golden Triangle to infiltrate the opium business, and many of the locals, terrorized by the CIA operations done in concert with the drug gangs, became commie sympathizers. And as the locals fought back against the CIA, U.S. involvement in Vietnam began. Anslinger sent agents to Burma and to Thailand, where the CIA had stationed hundreds of people for the previous ten years, and the CIA had given thousands of guns to the locals and trained them to keep communism out of Southeast Asia and the CIA worked with opium warlords because they were considered capitalists, while the communists wanted to crack down on the poppy trade. Anslinger's men made the mistake of trying to arrest the locals working for the CIA in the opium trade, and that did not go well because the CIA was selling opium into America to pay for the guns being given to the local capitalists, and Anslinger became the enemy of the CIA in Vietnam. <clears throat> in their desire to stop Fidel in Cuba, the CIA had asked the Italian Mafia for assistance, and while Bobby Kennedy was being paid to stamp out communism for the McClellan Commission, he'd come to the conclusion that the money being made in poppy sales had an Italian face. Jimmy Hoffa was half German and half Irish and Bobby Kennedy thought that Jimmy Hoffa had to be evil for being in charge of so much business, and Bobby couldn't understand how Hoffa's Teamsters were able to earn so much money just driving trucks. Bobby Kennedy was of Irish descent, and both McCarthy and McClellan were Irishmen, and Hoffa was in charge of the people who delivered all the food and clothing and shelter and just about anything else needed by people like the Kennedys. <clears throat> Hoffa's middle name was Riddle, and McClellan's middle name was Little, and the Teamsters were very good at going out on strike because their work kept the country alive. Without Teamsters, American business was dead in the water, and if the Teamsters wanted a decent living wage, people would simply have to pay what it cost to deliver the goods. Bobby didn't think this was fair since all the servants who had ever worked for the Kennedys were able to get by on much lower wages and were plenty grateful for it, and the help at the Kennedy house was awful, also much more polite than the Teamsters. 
the small-town working world of America was foreign to Bobby. But no more foreign than the Senate hearing, hearing room was to the hundreds of witnesses being bullied and threatened into testifying against their unions, and exposing all those working people to the marble halls of Washington, D.C., had not done them any more good than if the Democrats would have made an effort to work alongside the unions. <clears throat> Bobby's book, The Enemy Within, was a tearjerker that made many wonder that somebody didn't shoot him sooner, and judging from the tone of voice he used on his fellow Americans, the shot might have come from any of the hired help at the hotel that night, or any of the other working people emptying ashtrays and washing out cocktail glasses and cleaning up after the Democrats, but the fact was that RFK was murdered by a Moslem probably because Bobby was a Catholic, and there's nothing more frightening to Islamics than another Catholic president. The McClellan Commission ran from January of 1957 to March of 1960, and they found out that people such as butchers and garbage collectors and construction workers did not behave like the people known to the Kennedys and Bobby was horrified that working-class people did not know their place and failed to recognize and respond to his superior education and elevated manners. Bobby thought that working people who wanted to unionize were bad, and in his book Bobby pointed to the example of his staff lawyers willing to work all day long and well into the night seven days a week, and sometimes they worked throughout the night, and Bobby boasted in his book that none of the lawyers ever complained, and he wrote that they didn't do it just to keep their jobs because, quote, such men can always find jobs, close quote. The Enemy Within by Robert F. Kennedy, New York, Popular Library, 1960 page 163. When the Teamsters tried to keep track of all the money that flowed like water through their working days, a large chunk of it just evaporated because there were no computers to keep more careful records, and they were doing the best they could at the time with what they had. When Teamsters went out on strike, they could resort to violence because there were no video cameras to catch them in the act and in Hoffa's eyes it was all fair game because no amount of money could buy the status of a Kennedy even though the Kennedys were just rude upstarts to the people they were now among but what really got Bobby going was the way the Union gave jobs to family members and friends Hoffa thought the money he managed to procure for his workers and for himself was reasonable compensation for having to eat dirt and dust all day and all night and Hoffa thought that working people should at least enjoy life a little, since none of them had free time to hang out at country clubs, sitting around with old Harvard classmates, dropping names while making obscure references to old dead Greeks. Hoffa thought it all worked out in the end, class barriers being what they were at the time. But Bobby Jub judged Hoffa as a mafia man and called him a liar, and the things Bobby said about Hoffa could peel paint and curl paper. A man named Max had been working for the Carpenters' Union as a publicity writer, and the president of the Carpenters' Union had been invited to the White House, so Max had come along to meet President Ike. And Max had told the president about a great guy named Jimmy Hoffa, and Max said that he thought the president would really like to meet Hoffa. The Secretary of Labor gave an order that Max was not allowed into the White House again. And when Max was called before the McClellan Committee years later, Bobby wrote that Max, quote, had not changed when he appeared before us. He had a smooth, glib tongue, a quick mind, and utter gall. With his brazen, oily approach, he tried to fast-talk his way through our hearings in the same way he tried to fast-talk the President of the United States, close quote, the enemy within, Ibid. The McCarthy hearings had come to an abrupt end in 1954 when the Army drafted Roy Cohn's friend David Shine four months after the Korean War was over, and Roy Cohn tried to get him out of it, and the Army fought back, <clears throat> and Roy Cohn, Roy Cohn accused the Army of being pinko sympathizers, which was the wrong thing to say to people who had recently marched on Berlin. Roy Cohn had prosecuted Ethel and Julius Rosenberg when the Rosenbergs were being blamed for the Korean War, 
and in 1963 Roy Cohn was charged with perjury and obstruction of justice and conspiracy for lying to a grand jury, and he was tried in the same courtroom where he had tried Ethel and Julius. The Senate hearings to root out communism made a lot of money for lawyers, and reminded everyone that most parts of Europe witnessed in the early years of the 20th century a utopia of liberty. There was a freedom of speech, freedom of enterprise, freedom of movement, freedom of writing, on a scale which now seems to us fantastic and impossible. If we were offered the freedom which our grandfathers enjoyed before the First World War, we should not know what to do with it. We should be like men released after a long prison sentence, overwhelmed by our unaccustomed liberty. Revolutions and Revolutionaries, page 136. Senator McCarthy tried to put the Jew communists out of business who had escaped from Hitler and come to America. <clears throat> Senator McCarthy tried to put the Jew communists out of business who had escaped from Hitler and come to America. And McCarthy might have had some success except that he ran up against the Italians who were having none of it because they were the farthest thing from being communists as, as anyone could be and they were certainly unwilling to be smeared by the likes of Bobby Kennedy. During the McClellan hearings, one Italian man sued for defamation of character and was asking almost a million dollars in damages, so Harry Anslinger had the Italian government arrest him while the case in America was instantly dismissed. And as a Democrat from Arkansas, McClellan had been opposed to Ike's desegregation of schools. <clears throat> although, although they were no longer Rome, the Italians can be credited with not only putting a wrench into the Jew communist witch hunts in America, but they get the prize for keeping the Germans from wiping out the American army in Italy during Hitler's war due to their camaraderie and the common language spoken by Americans of Italian origin. Because they were once Romans, History seemed to revolve around the Italians, and Napoleon, who had shot off the nose of the Sphinx, had been from Sicily. And after 1890, the Italians came over to America in droves, because the Prussian victory of 1871 was making their businesses suffer. The Italians came to New Orleans, because it was such a European town and Italians murdered over 100 people with their old country ways, so the locals started hanging Italians from trees. Italy had become its own kingdom in 1861, with the capital at Turin, and moved the capital to Florence five years later, and Italy asked France to help them get free from the Austrians in Trieste, hoping for some restoration of its old Roman borders. And when France lost to Prussia in 1871, the capital was moved to Rome and the Black Hand migrated to America. While northern Italy wasn't so bad, the south was semi-feudal with absentee landlords and downtrodden tenants, and the Camorra had been operating in the south since at least 1820, while the Black Hand in northern Italy had formed in the face of the constantly changing rulers who usually spoke languages other than Italian. The Camorra were Neapolitans, and it was a government in the absence of any other government and most Italians who moved to America had gotten used to being their own law back home. The U.S. had been friendly to the New Kingdom of Italy in 1861 because Americans liked that they had united at the same time, just as the American war between the states was underway, and Americans liked that the Pope lived in Italy, whether or not they were Catholics. It was hard not to like the Italians who were so friendly and outgoing, and Italians had spread far and wide when they were once Rome, and by the time the English had garnered enough money to launch ocean-going ships, the Italians were sailing the seven seas under their banners faithful first to the Caesars and then to the Pope in Rome. In 1492, an Italian sailing from Genoa had discovered the Bahamas, which the English would call the West, Ind 
West Indies. And six years later, a Portuguese sailed to India for the first time in 1498, going around the Cape of Good Hope at the bottom of Africa. The following year, an Italian from Florence named Americus Vespucius sailed across the Atlantic to s land in South America, which the enlightened Italians would call the New World, and when large numbers of them came to New Orleans in 1870, they were just one, eth one ethnic group among many ethnic groups, but their successful methods brought particular attention to themselves. Even though Italians were honest and hard-working, the few tainted the reputation of all Italians, and the mayor of New Orleans, who was named Shakespeare, wanted to stop the law-breaking Italians after they purportedly killed the chief of police in 1890. So Shakespeare rounded up 19 Italians and put them on trial, but the jury failed to find them guilty. So a private mob of several thousand people marched to the courthouse and broke down the doors and hanged a dozen Ita of the Italians and killed some of them with gunfire. Italy recalled their minister to Washington in 1891 in protest of the Sicilian Mafia being lynched, and Washington apologized and paid a large amount of money at the time, $2,000, to the families of the lynched Italians, and the Mafia thought this was easy money from the U.S. government and proved that the Americans were a pushover, and they redoubled their old country ways. Three years later, some Italians were lynched in Colorado, and their families were given $3,000 apiece by the government. And the next year, three more Italians were lynched in Louisiana and received $2,000 each. And then a mob lynched five more Italians two years later in 1889, and two Italians were shot by an angry mob in Mississippi two years later, and their families were given $2,000. In Florida, a few years later, some Italians were lynched and their families received $3,000 apiece. And 1907 was the last big year of Italians moving to America, and an earthquake in the old country killed 150,000 people in Italy the following year. Italy went to war with Turkey in 1911 over the Islamists in Libya. And many more Italians came to America, while some migrated to South America because the language was similar. And although many more Germans had immigrated to America, the Italians were a close second at nearly five million of them before the Great War. Immigrants tended to stick together due to language and social barriers, and the Italians were also predominantly Catholic, which fueled the majority Protestant population in America against them, and that in turn had forced the Italians to stick even more closely together. The word family was very close to the word fascism, and the Mafia in Italy were a definite rival to Mussolini's power. Fascism was not about what you knew, but who you knew, and the word fascist came from the Latin fascis, that meant bundle, along with the Italian fascismo or fascio, that meant bundle, group, or assemblage. And fascism was a joint venture between the state and big business, more joint than venture. Mussolini's dream had been to expand Italy out to the borders of the old Roman Empire, and he'd begun by arresting 10,000 mafia while many of them found refuge in America. Mussolini disagreed with Hitler's Nazi policy about Jews, although Mussolini did have a problem with Jewish mobsters. But the fascist idea of having the state and private business working hand in glove together was shared, although Mussolini had a bigger problem with the workers' unions than Hitler, who simply bulldozed over them. Stalin also had a clear method for dealing with union agitators, as when workers in Posen and Poland would revolt on the 28th of June in 1956, and the Soviets stopped it by killing a couple dozen of them, with hundreds wounded and thousands arrested, and the rest of them had soon gone back to work, with no more complaining. Lucky Luciano had been paroled in America in 1946 because he'd helped in the war effort during Hitler's war. 
and the Mafia had a conference in 1957 where they agreed that they would not deal in drugs, and Anslinger had wanted Ambassador Claire Booth loose to get the Italian police to arrest Luciano during the war, but she could not, and Anslinger did not appreciate her play about the Nazis, while Senator McClellan thought that J. Edgar Hoover was being soft on the Italians. The Kingdom of Italy had first been called Alba Longa, and the king had invited all the downtrodden, disinherited, and discontinued, discontented people in the world to move into town in 753 B.C., and he told them to marry the Sabine women, and that was how the Roman Empire began. The king of Rome made the people vote in elections every two years, and for each rich senator they elected, they got to elect one of their own, and these were called tribunes. And the tribunes had an equal vote in the Senate, and were the heroes of the common folk, and could quash any official order and champion anyone's cause. In 486 B.C., the senators had to pay rent on the lands they owned, and they were made to give away much of it to the peasants and in 452 B.C. they wrote down the rules of good government and engraved them on brass sheets that were called the Laws of the Twelve Tables, and thereby Rome had created a government of the people. When Rome conquered, conquered a neighbor, the vanquished were invited to become citizens with the right to vote, and they would gather in great crowds to practice voting with thumbs up and thumbs down. Rome coined money that could be used all over the empire, and citizens were encouraged to journey to Rome over roads built by the military so soldiers wouldn't have to walk through mud. The Roman system worked because local regions settled their own matters democratically, while the senators were concerned only with matters of foreign wars. And when the Greeks came over to fight Rome in 280 B.C., they came with twenty elephants that scared the Romans so badly that the battle was won by the Greeks, who went back to Greece and took their Pyrrhic champion and their elephants with them. When Carthage heard about the Greek victory, they decided to pick a fight with Rome themselves, and Carthage was all of North Africa, including Sicily and Corsica, and some of Spain. Rome was Indo-Germanic, while Carthage was Semitic, and the Romans were planners and legislators and builders, while the Carthaginians were traders and artists. And Rome built military bases, while Carthage built gardens and decorated their homes. The Romans governed by consensus, while the Carthaginians lost themselves in internal coups with backstabbing leadership and continually, continual revolts from the peasants, and the war with Rome started in Sicily and spread to Carthage in 241 BC, and then involved Corsica and Cremona and Placentia, and in 218 B.C., Hannibal came from Spain and crossed the Alps and would spend 15 years fighting the Romans, but the Carthaginians failed to resupply Hannibal, and he had to retreat back home. When Rome made peace with Carthage, they were offered the same deal everyone else got from the Romans, an invitation to become citizens, and Macedonia became Roman in 213 B.C., and then Greece joined Rome, and the vanquished Carthaginian generals fled to Syria when Hannibal committed suicide sometime around 183 B.C., although it could have been murder. And Rome was free to finish off the rest of Carthage for good this time, but had to burn the capital city for seventeen days to get it done, and they scattered every stone to the wind. After the Carthaginian problem was solved, the Roman Empire became so large that citizens couldn't travel to Rome to vote, so local governors were appointed that would collect the taxes due and use those taxes for the good of the local Roman citizens. Many good things flowed towards Rome, and so did many bad things, and huge public buildings were built by enormous numbers of foreigners who had become slaves, and by the middle of the second century before Christ, there were five million Roman citizens and twelve million slaves. Millions more rabble from around the empire were pouring into Rome, while there was no official method of proving who was a Roman and who was not. 
So the actual Roman citizens displayed their citizenship status by public displays of wealth that they had obtained from their fair distribution of taxes until it all just simply got out of hand. <clears throat> Julius Caesar spent seven years in France trying to convince them to become Romans, and when the Senate ordered Caesar to return to Rome, Julius Caesar still had another year to serve in his elected post, and so he refused to leave France. The Senate declared him an enemy of the people, so Caesar came back and swam across the Rubicon in 49 BC, and he took over Rome in 60 days, when all he had wanted was for the Senate to agree that he should be allowed to stay in France for another year, since he had won that post in a free and fair election. Instead, Caesar was elected dictator, and it had seemed like a good idea at the time, and his enemies fled to Greece and then to Egypt. So Caesar and his military followed them, but in Egypt he fell in love with Cleopatra, even though she was already married to her younger brother, who quickly declared war on Caesar, and the Romans burned down their library at Alexandra, even though the fire had started as an accident. When her brother was killed in the fighting, Caesar was allowed to marry Cleopatra, and when asked for the details later, all Caesar would say was, I came, I saw, I conquered. Caesar rode triumphantly into Rome in the summer of 46 BC, cheered by the crowds, and the sad thing was that Rome had become a monarchy with Julius Caesar and the Republic was now dead. Caesar was named Imperator, that was the military word for commander, and the word emperor came from the word imperator cut short, and nobody complained about Caesar's new title because it was much easier to have a dictator than to keep up with all that heavy voting. Some of the senators wanted to restore the Republic, and so they murdered Caesar on the 15th of March in 44 BC when Caesar was 56 years old. But instead of a Republic, the senators started fighting among themselves as to who would become the new Caesar. And blood was shed, and Mark Antony headed for the eastern part of the empire, where he ran into Cleopatra and fell in love. Mark Antony divorced his Roman wife, whose brother was in charge of the western part of the empire, and her brother declared war on Mark Antony. And Cleopatra helped Mark Antony in the ensuing mother-of-all sea battles, but to no avail, because much of Mark Antony's rowing crews had come down with malaria. Mark Antony fled back to Egypt in 31 BC, and the following year the western ruler came to Egypt to dispense with him, and Cleopatra hid in an Egyptian monument and sent her slaves to tell Mark Antony that she was dead, hoping the message would be intercepted by the western ruler so he would give up and go back to Rome. Unfortunately, the message got through to Mark Antony anyway, and he tried to kill himself, but then Mark Antony heard that Cleopatra was not dead, so Mark Antony had himself carried to see her, and he died at her feet, while Cleopatra killed herself, and Egypt became a province of Rome. The western winner renamed himself Caesar Augustus in 30 BC, and he was 36 years old, and the Senate was allowed to rubber stamp whatever Caesar Augustus wanted, and the citizens were still allowed to vote for their local leaders, but only those pre-approved by Caesar Augustus were allowed on the ballot. The sheer size of the Roman Empire caused the world to become divided into three parts. The Latin part with its headquarters at Rome, the Orient with its center in Syria that included Egypt, and the Greek part with its dominant language everywhere between Rome and Syria, and 100 million people lived in the Latin part, but half of them were slaves, and in Rome itself there were two and a half million people. Caesar Augustus rebuilt the town in marble, and the Circus Maximus alone could seat 200,000 citizens and the Colosseum could hold half that many, and was designed for watching gladiators and other sporting events. 
To make up for their lack of republican government, Caesar Augustus gave them theater and public baths, and he built dozens of stone channels that made whole rivers flow into Rome from great distances, and these waterways were sometimes interrupted by fancy fountains. Caesar Augustus supported the arts and sponsored writers and historians, but no matter how skilled they had become, when Jesus Christ was born, they would all disagree on the date. In 9 AD, the Roman army up north met their doom at the hands of Hermann the German, and the Romans died almost to the last man in the shadowy depths of Germany's forests, and Rome would never again threaten the fatherland and Caesar Augustus would die in five years, die five years later, <clears throat> after ruling for fifty years, give or take a few according to the best Roman historians of the time. The unconquerable Germans had created their own strange myths and were following their own thunder gods who were living in the vast, deep northern forest, and the Germans had fierce blue eyes and grew taller than the other Europeans, and these were the people who would create Gothic architecture, those large, sturdy structures quickly constructed, constructed with a minimum of frills, with a minimum of frills, unless those large Gothic architecture, those large, sturdy structures quickly constructed with a minimum of frills, unlike the French who lived in a more temperate climate and had more time for decoration. The further one traveled away from Rome, the more the Roman citizens had married into the local populations, until there were more locals than Romans calling themselves Roman, and there were more Germans than anyone else claiming to be Roman. <clears throat> because so many soldiers had been sent to Germany in hopes of making Romans out of the Germans. Back in Rome, emperors came and went, more going than coming, until the crown of Caesar was being sold by the military at auction to the highest bidder, but none were ever able to conquer the stalwart leather-clad Germans in the north. Rome was plagued by a succession of assassinated Caesars, at one point fifty of them within fifty years, until Constantine became Caesar in 323 AD and managed to separate the military from the civilian government. Constantine had seen a cross in the sky, and he became a Christian, and Constantine ordered all of Rome to become born again and be baptized in the Spirit, and he joined the old pagan holidays to Christianity so everyone would feel right at home with the new religion. Constantine moved the capital of the Roman Empire to Constantinople, and he renamed the city after himself and Constantinople would remain the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire until 1453, while the western half only lasted until the year 476 when Romulus Augustulus failed to stop the Germans who were emerging from the same forests where Hermann the German had become a legend. Because there were so many Germans who had already found their way into the ranks of the Roman military, the taker of the takeover of Rome by Germany went pretty smoothly. Everyone wanted to be Roman again in 1935, <clears throat> and because citizen participation of the common man in government had be begun in Rome, the emergence of self-help groups and neighborhood circles in the 30s was all the rage, with a hankering back to the olden days of governing from the bottom up rather than from the top down. The most important part of the Roman method was that a king or a Caesar was made to rely on enthusiastic volunteers joining the army, rather than forced conscription, and with the gift of Roman citizenship, the template was trade rather than subjugation and slavery, and Hitler wanted to bring that spirit of Germanic citizenship back just as soon as he could convince the globalists that his was a better idea than their hope for a utopian paradise of communism, Jewish or not. Roman armies had first arrived in Germany about 50 years before Jesus was born, and when Jesus was 16 years old, the Germans came down and replaced the Romans as the toughest people in Italy, and Rome never again tried to cross the Rhine or the Danube but left the barbarians up north alone to themselves. 
The Schwabians had been chased up into the Vosges Mountains by Julius Caesar, and Tacitus called them Swabians, and they included the Hermanones living along the Elbe River in Bavaria and Bohemia. The Germanic peoples went as far east as the Vistula River, after which the Prussians held sway, and the Romans got as far north up the Danube as Regensburg that was seventy miles south of Bayreuth, where they built a nice Roman fort, and a large group of Swabians became friends of Rome and were allowed to march across the Pyrenees to settle in northern Portugal. Because St. Paul had been a Roman citizen, as well as a highly educated Jew, Paul spoke Roman Latin as well as Greek, and he was able to spread the Christian church to the West instead of Christianity staying only where Greek or Hebrew was spoken. All the countries in Europe governed by Rome used what they wanted from Rome's language, and so English, Spanish, and French were built on Latin, while the Germans spoke their own strange language with its alien Gothic printing and unique logical structure, and the Latin spoken by Romans would die out after the fall of Rome in 476. People had run away from paying Roman taxes to hide up north in the sheltering German forests, and Germans would come down south to visit the fabled Rome of which they had heard such glorious stories, and while historians refer to quote-unquote barbarian invasions, it was actually a pretty friendly deal on both sides. When the northern forest tribes would come down south, they became Roman citizens and joined the army and rose through the ranks to become Roman officers until Gothic Germans were the majority of Rome's military, while most of the other Romans were busy elsewhere. <laughs>